Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, we're very happy to have Matthias Erhardt speak this week. So Matthias is a Leverhulme Fellow and a Prize Fellow at the University of Bath. And he's also a co-director in the Centre for Mathematics and Algorithms for Data. Um, he was previously a uh, postdoc at Cambridge and very briefly at UCL, where he also did his uh, PhD. Um, and he works as the area of optimization in those problems, imaging and, and machine learning. Um, so we're very happy to have you here uh, to speak this week, Matthias, uh, on bi-level learning for inverse problems. So please uh, take it away. Thank you very much for the invitation and the kind introduction. Uh, yeah, as Matt said, uh, I will talk about bi-level learning for inverse problems. And in particular, I will talk about, uh, oh, now the sun is coming out in Germany, but I think that will be fine. Um, so uh, I will talk in particular about two papers. Um, so one of them is together with Lyndon Roberts uh, from Canberra in Australia. And one is with a number of co-authors. Um, so like most importantly, my PhD student, Ferdi Asheri, who has done most of the work, but uh, also for instance, with Martin Benning, who is covering in the audience at the INI today. All right. Um, the talk is divided into, into four parts. So first of all, I would like to give a motivation, um, sort of like, so sort of why are we even interested in, in inverse problems and what are inverse problems? What is our approach to solving inverse problems? Uh, and then in the second part, uh, I want to talk about bi-level learning. And so this is basically sort of like some machine learning concept, sort of like how to learn some parameters in a variation organization model. Um, and then finally, I would like to talk about two papers, as I said before. So uh, first of all, I would like to uh, answer the question, can we solve uh, bi-level learning problems efficiently? And uh, so here, the paper that I want to present, kind of like the, the answer is yes. So like if the number of parameters is sort of like small enough, but I will uh, talk about this like uh, in more detail later on what this means, then sort of like we developed uh, so-called inexact root-free optimization algorithms that can that can solve this quite efficiently. And uh, another question is uh, so like what about sort of like high-dimensional examples? Uh, sort of like um, uh, so sort of like to what extent can we sort of push the boundaries? And so um, there, I would like to present the work on learning in uh, in the MR sampling pattern where sort of like the number of unknowns uh, that, that we learn on parameters can go like up to the millions. All right. So first of all, let's uh, uh, a super brief introduction to kind of like inverse problems for those of you who don't know what it is and for others uh, who do know, so sort of like some, uh, some notation. So this work, I am considering linear inverse problems, um, AX equal to B, where X is our desired solution. Y is our observed data, and A is a mathematical model that links the two. And so like the, the, the goal in inverse problems is so like if we have some given usually measured uh, data Y, then uh, we would like to recover our unknown X. And uh, so inverse problems of like are like around uh, since a while and sort of like uh, a very classical definition of kind of like what can go wrong with inverse problems goes back to Jacques Alamar. Uh, who is saying sort of like an inverse problem AX equal to Y is called well post if a solution exists, if the solution is unique. And in addition, also the solution needs to depend continuously on the data Y. So that like small errors in the measurement Y, they shouldn't lead to large errors in, uh, in the solution X star. And if one of these conditions is not fulfilled, then he calls it an inverse problem ill post. And uh, the catch is that most interesting inverse problems, they are actually ill post in one way or the other. So uh, we always have to deal with this ill postness. Okay, so therefore, like, how do we then actually solve inverse problems? And there are many different ways. And so the one that I present here sort of like started to become dominant in the 1990s, perhaps uh, in imaging. Uh, and uh, it's called variation regularization, where instead of solving the original inverse problem AX equal to Y directly, we approximate this uh, with a solution of an optimization problem, where on the one hand, we want to fit AX, uh, should be like close to Y in a certain sense. Uh, but then in addition, also our solution should be regular, should, should have a small function value R. 
So here this D is also called the data fidelity, which is related to noise statistics. So if the noise is Gaussian, then people usually use like an L2 squared error. Uh, but also you can use, a, use an L1 norm, you can use a quick Leibler divergence if you have Poisson data and so on. As I said, the regulars R penalizes unwanted features, uh, but it's also there to kind of like ensure stability. And if you uh, if you desire, can also guarantee uniqueness of the solution. And then there's a small parameter lambda, with the, the so-called regulation parameter that trades off these two things. So, like if lambda is zero, right, then we fit the data perfectly, and so we have uh, we have uh, we're, we're going back to like our original problem to the to, uh, to original solution to the inverse problem. And as the lambda increases, so sort of like we put more and more weight onto the regularizer R. And so there are, there are many, many textbooks uh, on this topic. So like I won't go into more detail here. Um, but if you have a concrete inverse problem to solve, then sort of like one question that you have to answer is sort of like which regularizer to choose. And it turns out there are a number of them. So uh, very classical, there's so called like Tikhonov regularization, where our regularizer penalizes the uh, the, uh, the L2 norm squared, or like more general any any Hilbert norm squared. Um, one can also have semi norms like the H1 squared semi norm um, if you want to penalize gradients in a in a certain way. Uh, but then starting from the 1990s, sort of like non-smooth uh, options became uh, became more popular. Uh, for instance, like the total variation. Um, so like if the uh, X is smooth enough, then you can think of it as the one norm on the gradient. And if you want to denoise an image using total variation, for instance, in the, the image here on the left, uh, then you kind of like can uh, get rid of the noise very efficiently. Um, and in addition, you can also get like sharp edges um, at the cost that sort of like you see like some kind of staircasing in there. It's a bit difficult to see here, but like some uh, some bits you see there. And in order to overcome staircasing, people then went back to the drawing board and then developed the total generalized variation, which you can think of as kind of like a second order total variation term. And so where you have like sharp edges and these nice uh, smooth uh, transitions. And so now the question is, uh, ultimately these are also, uh, just like four examples, right? I mean, they, there are like many, many more handcrafted regularizers which are out in the literature. But kind of like among all of these choices, then sort of like a question is, how do you choose uh, the, the regularizer, which is kind of like not clear a priori? Um, in addition, also, so like these are kind of like the the, the the building blocks of a regularizer. In practice, often you see even sort of like more complicated variants. Um, so, for instance, like uh, here is a uh, is a discretized total variation regularizer, um, and so this regularizer is now is not strongly convex and not smooth. So, so you can't, for instance, use a like great descent or anything like this in order to solve this problem. And so, one option uh, that you can do, I mean, so there are algorithms that can solve the non-smooth problem directly. Uh, another option would be to kind of like amend the regularizer a little bit. Uh, and so, for instance, like to uh, to approximate the norm uh, by uh, by having a smooth approximation and and by adding sort of like a small multiple of the two norm squared. So, like this new regularizer is a little bit like the total variation, but it's smooth and strongly convex. But now, instead of having only one parameter, so this model has three parameters that the user can tune. And each of the of the parameters has an, uh, has an important uh, impact on the uh, on the reconstruction uh, in sometimes like maybe like some like unintuitive, uh, unintuitive ways. So like for instance, with the smoothing here, if you choose a smoothing too large, as you can see here for some denoising example, then actually we get back our our noisy solution. So there's no smoothing effect anymore. Um, so yeah, and then, like the question is, how do we choose all of those parameters? So one application um, that I would like to talk a bit more in detail is um, undersampled MRI reconstruction. So the MRI forward modeling that relates the image to the data is the uh, continuous Fourier transform. Um, and uh, kind of like it's, uh, it's di uh, discretized versions of like would be sort of like an undersampled discrete Fourier transform. And so here the task is giving, uh, given a certain set of uh, discrete Fourier samples, so like we would like to recover um, our our image, uh, get our image back. And so here the problem is uh, is ill-posed in the sense that the solution is not unique since the four operator has a large kernel, and so we need to we need to overcome this. 
Um, so like the first people who looked at, uh, at the sort of like MRI, or like undersampled MRI um, reconstruction uh, was uh, Mickey Lustig and co-authors. And so they consider um, having, a, having a total variation regularizer um, and then to do the reconstruction this way. And so here at the bottom, I would like to show you the impact of, uh, of the sampling patterns, so like, uh, which discrete samples we actually pick on the reconstruction. So here on the left, you can see the sampling pattern where like a color means that this discrete FOIA coefficient has been sampled. In the second column, we can see the reconstruction uh, if we don't choose any regularization. And on the right, we can see like uh, the variational uh, um, uh, uh, regularized reconstruction using TV with a parameter that I have tuned manually. And so kind of like if we have like a complete set of discrete Fourier coefficients, then we get a, a very good reconstruction in, in both cases, whether we use a regularizer or not. If we use, for instance, like a radial sampling pattern, so like now these white areas mean that these discrete Fourier coefficients have not been sampled. So if we don't use a regularizer, then we get a very, very bad reconstruction. And if we use total variation as a regularizer, we get something that looks reasonable. We've lost some details, but still kind of the overall structures are nicely visible. Then we can also sample uniform and random. And then sort of like this results in some artifacts that look a bit like clouds, almost like, a, like, like some, some mist. Um, and uh, sort of like these, uh, the, the total variation can, uh, uh, can, uh, can resolve quite efficiently. Another sampling pattern that is quite popular in practice, especially in more like in parallel MRI, um, is to kind of like so-called Cartesian sampling, where, where you sample sort of like every other line, for instance, in, uh, in, uh, in Fourier space. And if you then do, do the reconstruction uh, without a regularizer, then you can see like, this uh, type of a ghosting artifact. And if you choose the total variation, then this is not really able uh, to, uh, to like, resolve this ghosting so like uncertainty, like which of these ghosts kind of is the true ghost. So like the ghosts are still visible and everything uh, was kind of quite oversmoothed. So here are a number of open questions. So like, first of all, how do, we, how do we choose the sampling pattern? Is there an optimal sampling pattern? And does a good or the optimal sampling pattern depend on the regularization and the uh, regulation parameter? And so like there are like many of these uh, open questions. So, oops, in order to kind of like sum up this uh, motivation section of my talk, so inverse problems can be solved via variation regularization, but then these models have a number of parameters. So like the choice of the regularizer can be seen as a parameter, then there's the explicit regularization parameter that have to be tuned. Um, if you are in MRI, for instance, then sort of like how to sample uh, the image is a parameter or like a number of parameters. Uh, if you want uh, some smooth approximation of your total variation or some strong convexity, this all adds up to parameters. And um, some of these parameters have some underlying theory how to choose them, but even if they have theory, they're still quite difficult to choose in practice. And some of these parameters even have no real underlying theory or just like some very, very coarse guidelines how to choose them. So like the take home message, basically sort of like uh, as a, as a, uh, as a uh, as a practitioner, it's quite difficult to choose all of these things among all those uh, possibilities. Okay, so here we would like to, uh, to provide a solution uh, how to choose many of these parameters using bi-level learning. So what is bi-level learning? So like as a, as a recap, so now we are uh, solving our inverse problem uh, using variation regularization. So like X hat is now our, our minimizer. We have like our data fidelity and the regularizer. And so the idea is that uh, we have given some, some patch training data that we call here um, uh, X dagger and Y, where Y is sort of like, uh, sort of like the, um, the data that sort of like fits to the inverse problem. Um, so sort of like we have like that X dagger A uh, is equal to Y up to some noise epsilon. And so now we would like to find uh, the parameters such that our recovered solution is as close as possible to our ideal solution, X dagger, uh, with the constraint that uh, X hat should solve this optimization problem. So here now, uh, kind of like for simplicity, like I wrote this down, you, uh, learning only one parameter, like the regulation parameter, but it's, uh, it's like very easy to see, right? So like how you can like generalize to like any number of parameters. And so in inverse problems, uh, this type of approach to learning parameters has been uh, popularized by Karl Kunisch, Tom Pock, 
Juan Carlos de los Reyes and Carola Schönlieb in uh, 2013. But uh, from an optimization point of view, actually, sort of like this is something that is super old, super old fashioned. Um, so kind of like by level uh, optimization actually goes back to uh, uh, von Stuckelberg in the 1930s, where he considered similar problems in, uh, uh, in, uh, in economics. So like in, in his PhD thesis 1934, he kind of formulated this for the first time in this very rich literature in optimization, but kind of like only fairly recently uh, became, uh, was used kind of like for inverse problems. Of course, uh, we are not really interested in solving exactly this problem that I uh, described here, because if we already know what our optimal solution x dagger is, then sort of like we don't need to find optimal parameters lambda. But what we are actually interested in is like if we have like a large set of training data, then to learn a parameter such that for the, for the new kind of like unseen example, uh, this new, like this, uh, this, uh, these parameters, they do quite well on new data. So this is kind of like uh, the real deal. Okay, so how do we solve um, bi-level problems? Um, so for simplicity, now let's uh, let's look at the setting where we have only one training data point, uh, but uh, like all the formulas very easily generalize to kind of like more training data. But for simplicity, let's stick to one. And so this is kind of like the exact example that I was talking about earlier, but now let's uh, make this sort of like a bit more, uh, a bit more general, which also like simplifies the notation a bit. So instead of having the specific uh, upper level problem that I had a second ago, now uh, we just like denote our upper level function u as a, uh, as a function of x hat, where x hat solved this uh, optimization problem. And the same we do for the lower level problem, um, where we denote the, uh, the lower level objective by L that has two arguments, X and lambda. And for simplicity, we also assume that sort of like the lower level problem L is kind of nice enough such that we have a unique solution, which we then can call X hat. Okay, so since we have this unique solution, we can now define a mapping from the parameters to the solution of the lower level problem. Uh, and this we, uh, we denote by x of lambda. So therefore we can uh, define uh, the so-called reduced formulation where we replace the dependency on x hat and write this as x of lambda. Or we can also like define a new function utility as a function of lambda such that this bi-level problem actually becomes now a single level problem, uh, but now with a, with a fairly complicated function uh, uh, u lambda in here that sort of like, yeah, sort of has this like fairly abstract definition of, uh, of the solution given, given certain sort of parameters. Okay, but uh, if now the, the L is uh, smooth enough, uh, then sort of like we know that, that this mapping X of lambda satisfies sort of like first order optimality conditions. And we, we can now take the, uh, another derivative uh, of the first order optimality conditions which then gives us um, a condition, sort of like how we get the derivative of the solution mapping with respect to lambda. So here on the on the right, we can uh, we can see that sort of like the the derivative of x with respect to lambda is is given by sort of like uh, the the inverse of of b applied to a, where sort of like b is is this uh, is this Hessian right, and then a is this uh, this right hand side here. And so, like given given the solution mapping, uh, given the derivative of the solution mapping, we can now uh, compute what is the derivative of uh, of utility. And so, like via the via the chain rule, uh, we get uh, we get this formula. And now, sort of like if we plug in the the uh, the, the formula we had before for the derivative. We get that uh, sort of like in order to like, get the gradient, we can first solve a system of linear equation and then apply a star to it, and this gives us the gradient. And so, if we know how to get the gradient, then sort of like this, like very easily, sort of like defines or uh, or like uh, or like motivates like a number of uh, of algorithms, basically like anything that like uh, only uses first order information, such as gradient descent, quasi Newton method, such as LBFGSB, and so on. So in the, the kind of like high level algorithm goes uh, um, uh, as follows. So given our, our current set of parameters lambda, we compute what X of lambda is via any algorithm of your choice, like the primitive gradient or like 
anything else. We then need to solve a system of linear equations uh, where sort of like the system is related to the Hessian of the lower level problem. Um, and then we just like, need to compute like another uh, uh, matrix, uh, 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 matrix vector product, which gives us the gradient. Okay, so, but this approach of like, we can write down fairly easily, but this has a number of problems. So first of all, this solution mapping X of lambda has to be computed exactly. And in practice, we can't do that. So we have to, uh, have to uh, rely on some algorithm that gives us some approximation. Then the formula for the derivative assumes that we had known X of lambda exactly. So like, it's not so clear anymore if we now plug in sort of like some approximate solution X of lambda, what happens to this formula and how these errors propagate. Then moreover, a large system of linear equations has to be solved. And again, these won't be uh, solved exactly. So this is more of a theoretical algorithm. And of, co of course you can make numerical approximations to all of this, but then it's not really clear anymore sort of like how good of a gradient you then compute and what even happens when you then run, let's say like gradient descent across the Newton methods with this approximate gradient. And so, um, so like how do people solve the sort of like bi uh, problems in practice? So uh, most of the literature that, uh, that I've seen so sort of like people usually ignore these problems and just like have these numerical approximations to kind of like the solution mapping gradients and uh, linear systems. And they just like ignore it um, and you get something out and fingers crossed that this is a, a good approximation to what you're actually after. Um, if, uh, for instance, uh, the, the low level problem is non-smooth, then sort of like uh, exactly this, uh, this, uh, uh, this approach also like wouldn't work anymore, right? So we, because we re, like required smoothness for this to be to be well posed, and but like if uh, things are non-smooth, then sort of like for instance, Karl Kunisch and Tom Pock they developed a semi uh, semi smooth Newton method uh, in order to uh, solve this bilevel problem, or like another strategy by Peter Ox, Tom Pock, and co-workers is to um, is to replace the lower level problem with an with a number of iterations of a lower level solver. And then you can basically sort of like uh, differentiate through the solver um, and then thereby sort of like get an approximate solution to the bilevel problem. Um, in this work now, we would like to go a different route and we want to solve the original bilevel problem, but we want to use an algorithm that acknowledges these difficulties. So uh, that explicitly makes use of the fact that all these computations can only ever be inexact, but still has convergence properties. All right, so the idea in a, in a nutshell um, is that sort of like, if we want to minimize uh, a function f of theta, then we, uh, and we sort of so acknowledge the fact that we can never evaluate f exactly, but instead we have access to f epsilon, where for any theta, f epsilon is always exactly uh, uh, epsilon away from the, from the true function value. And so kind of like the idea is sort of like, if we have a certain approximation, um, then sort of like we can uh, we can relate the uh, sort of like uh, whether we have like some descent or not uh, like depending on these accuracies. So like if we find uh, uh, new parameters such that sort of like f epsilon k plus one of these new updated parameters is strictly smaller than the old approximation f epsilon k at theta k uh, minus sort of like the sum of accuracies, right? Then from this it follows directly that we have a monotonic descent in function vectors, right? So like. This is some sort of argument how we can relate sort of like inexact computation to a statement on the function values exactly. So this is not exactly what we have been uh, we've been using, but the idea is kind of uh, kind of similar. So what we've been using is a is a model based approach, where sort of like um, sort of like instead of uh, of evaluating function directly, we uh, we create a model that sort of like that approximates actually not even f but f epsilon k at every iteration. And then we can uh, we can minimize uh, explicitly this new model to get updated parameters. And then if the model decrease is sufficient compared to the function error, then we accept the step. And otherwise, sort of like we make the model more accurate. Um, and so sort of like the uh, the algorithms sort of like explicitly shown here on the right, and as with basically all dirt free optimization algorithms, they look quite uh, quite horribly. But then, sort of like they are fairly easy to implement, but so sort of like mathematically, it's, it's obviously quite difficult to like uh, to like write down because there are like many if-else statements and so on. 
And what we can prove uh, for this algorithm is that sort of like if the function f is sufficiently smooth and bound from below, so it even makes sense to kind of like, uh, uh, like try to solve this problem, then the algorithm is globally convergent in the sense that, uh, that the gradients converge to zero. Okay. So like how does this uh, algorithm kind of like uh, sort of like do in practice? So uh, here we are, we're looking at denoising. So we want to we want to denoise um, uh, some uh, some data using a, a smooth approximation to the total variation, having a strongly uh, strongly convex uh, sort of like regularizer in addition also attached to it. And so now uh, here our our upper level problem we not only want to fit our um, uh, our our ground truth data xi, but then in addition we say we want to penalize uh, the condition number of the lower level problem. Right, so uh, so this is kind of like, oops, uh, wait a second. Actually, this kappa is not supposed to be kappa. Sorry, sorry, sorry. This is uh, this is supposed to be uh, the condition number. So like basically like the smoothness of the of the lower level problem uh, divided by its strong convexity. So this, this is supposed to be mu. So kind of like we want to fit the data as as good as possible. But we also want to solve the lower problems as efficient as we can. Uh, so therefore, we want to have that the lower problem has a small condition number. Okay. So like, how, how does it look, uh, look like in practice? So like, when we start our our iterations, then sort of like these uh, these blue dashed lines um, are our ground truth solution. Like one uh, like one example of the of the uh, of a of ground truth solution. The uh, the yellow one is our noisy data, and the red one is the current estimate. And so, like as the as the sort of like upper level algorithm progresses, right? So like the the uh, the red curve sort of like goes gets closer and closer to the to the ground truth. So like after like hundred iterations of the upper level algorithm, we approximate the ground truth quite well. Oops. So like this kind of like just shows that sort of like the algorithm is kind of like doing roughly what's uh, what's supposed to be doing. But then the 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 real important bit is so what uh, what about efficiency? So here now we we compare basically six different algorithms. Although you can think of kind of like maybe like let's let's look at this uh, this graph in like two ways. Let's first of all uh, compare the sh the the shades of yellow, orange, and uh, and red. So this is when we approximate the lower level uh, problem by a fixed number of grade descent iterations. So the um, so the so the yellow one is we approximate the lower solution by a thousand uh, gradient descent iterations. The orange one was ten thousand, and the uh, and the red one is our uh, our dynamic approach, where we tell basically the lower level problem how many iterations uh, should you run until you get a certain accuracy, and so that we kind of like only have like function values. Which are sort of like as inaccurate as possible, like as cheap as possible, but sufficiently accurate for the algorithm to then converge. And here on the on the x-axis, we see our lower level problem iterations, right? Which is uh, uh, you can uh, you can think of like as the overall computational cost. And on the y-axis, we have the upper level objective, right? So we want that the upper level objective goes as uh, as low as possible, and it should uh, it should go down as quickly as possible in terms of the the x-axis. And as we can see, the, the, the red curve goes uh, goes down much, much quicker than the than the yellow and the orange, indicating that this dynamic approach sort of like is much more efficient. The like in early iterations of like we need a lot less than like a thousand gradient descent iterations in order to have like a sufficient decrease, but still we are convergent. The same is true in the in the shades of blue when we uh, approximate the lower problem not with gradient descent but with FISTA. Um, and so sort of we like uh, converge to something similar, but we do this much much faster. All right. Um, here in in this figure, we look at sort of like how robust the solution procedure is. So here on the x-axis is our uh, initial guess for the regularization parameter, and on the y-axis is the final estimate. Right. So. What we ideally want, right, is like no matter where we start with our regularization parameter, we always get the best one. So, like ideally, this graph should look constant. And if it doesn't look constant, sort of like then this might be, for instance, a source of non-convexity, for instance. 
And what is quite interesting is that uh, only the low accuracy gradient descent and low accuracy, uh, uh, low accuracy FISTA are actually non-constant. So high accuracy gradient descent, high accuracy FISTA, as well as dynamic accuracy gradient descent and FISTA, they, they all are constant, indicating that despite the overall problem being non-convex, it seems to be fairly robust when it comes to initialization. Uh, at least if we solve the lower problem so, to like a sufficiently high accuracy. Okay, so uh, another test that we made also is that uh, whether the, uh, the learned uh, regularization parameter, whether this leads then to conversion regularization. So, and uh, what we kind of like are after is that sort of like here on the x-axis, we have the noise level and on the y-axis, we, uh, we have the learned parameter. Uh, the, sorry, the learned, the learned parameter like in blue and on the on the right, we have the ratio of the noise level with the learned parameter. So we want that as the uh, as the parameter goes to zero, so sorry, as the, as the noise level goes to zero, we want exactly that this ratio, like the orange line goes to zero. And this is exactly what we observe. So like kind of, this is like some heuristical argument that perhaps this type of a bi-level learning for the regulation parameter is actually a converge or a leads to convergent uh, 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 regulation strategy. All right, so um, up to this point, it uh, was all about sort of like uh, how to solve uh, the bi-level problems uh, with the algorithms uh, for it. And so now I would like to talk about learning the sampling pattern, but like, are there any questions up to this point? So I will stop for a few seconds to give you time to think whether you have a question or not. Otherwise, let's talk about MRI. No questions so far? Good. All right. So when learning the uh, so, uh, learning the sampling pattern or like how to choose the sampling pattern, sort of like is a problem that's basically sort of like as old as as uh, people start to think about uh, compress sensing MRI, so like it's now sort of like the regularizer influences the reconstruction. So people were thinking sort of like how to choose, uh, like which sampling pattern to choose. And so uh, in the beginning, people were using so called, or like what, uh, what I call kind of like uninformed uh, 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 sampling pattern, where sort of like, uh, like a human sort of like, yeah, makes like choices. Like, like whatever they, they like, basically. So like in the beginning, they, they try some Cartesian approaches. Uh, then they also try like radio sampling pattern. They tried um, uh, sampling pattern where, uh, where sort of like, which are, which are random, uh, either random or uniform, or like with a, with a variable density random uh, sampling pattern. And uh, so like these are very simple to implement. But on the, on the downside, these are not tailored to any application nor reconstruction method nor anything, right? So these are sort of like fairly ad hoc, fairly general, but they're not really optimal for anything, right? So just because they are so general. Um, then, so like in the mathematical compress sensing theory, so sort of like there are a number of approaches now, so sort of like they tell you a little bit sort of like, maybe sort of like how you should choose a sampling pattern uh, such that sort of like it fits uh, into the mathematical theory of compass sensing, so such that you have like mathematical guarantees. Um, so kind of like in the original work by Kandis and Romberg. So I think there one has a L1 regularizer, and then you sample uniform at random. Uh, but then sort of like there are other works, and also like uh, something that's uh, published fairly recently by Gita Kutinyok and Lim. Uh, where the regularizer is now sparsity on shielded coefficients, and so like they then come up with a certain still random, but with a with like a non-uniform and random pattern, and they can also prove a certain robustness. Uh, and like why it's great that you have mathematical guarantees. Um, so sort of like basically everything in this literature, you're limited to sparse signals in a certain sense, and you're uh, limited to sparsely promoting regularizers such as L1. Um, L1 on shielded coefficients and so on and so forth. Um, starting in 2011, uh, people started a different line of research where they uh, want to learn the uh, a good sampling pattern from data. And so like in the original work by Florian Knoll and co-authors, uh, people just um, uh, 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 took like a set of, uh, of, uh, of MR images 
we're looking at their Fourier coefficients. And uh, like, for instance, I mean, if you want to sample, let's say like, I don't know, like 5% of the, of the Fourier coefficients, they were then choosing sort of like across the training set, which are the largest Fourier coefficients. And so this strategy is very simple to implement. It's very computationally efficient. It's even optimal if you don't use a regularizer, right? Then it's optimal. So if you're, if you're after the minimum norm solution, but it's not tailored to any more sophisticated reconstruction method in this sense of like, it's not quite optimal. Um, and then sort of like fairly, fairly recently, like a few years ago, sort of like people started a bit more sophisticated machine learning based approaches. So for instance, in the lab of uh, Volkan Cheva, uh, sort of like they looked at a greedy approach where sort of like basically among all possible sampling patterns, they sort of like check almost like all of them so sort of like which and then sort of like which give you like a good reconstruction or or maybe like let's uh, maybe like uh, give like a bit, bit more details for like what they do. They start with a certain sampling pattern. Let's say for instance, like we say no sampling, then they try all possible samples and see which of all possible samples give you sort of like the smallest error. Let's say like on your training set, and then you uh, then you put the sample into your um, into your into your sampling set. And then you try all other possible uh, sampling points again, check which gives you the smallest training error. Um, and then sort of like you like gradually uh, uh, increase your, your sampling set. And then so you stop once you have uh, like, uh, you have reached a size uh, up to what you want to sample. So this is adaptive to any data set. It's adaptive to any reconstruction method. So this is great. On the downside or potential downside, this strategy only works for discrete values. So you can't learn the regularization parameter, for instance, with a strategy. And it's computationally very, very heavy, right? So because you, like in some sense, you have to, uh, you have something that, that scales uh, with the, with the uh, uh, n factorial, where n is, uh, is the number of, uh, of sampling points. So like this only really works kind of like if the number of choices is fairly limited. Um, another strategy uh, very recently is uh, based on deep learning approaches. So if we, for instance, scrap the idea that we want to reconstruct our images based on, uh, based on a variational model, but if, if instead we have a neural network that does it, for instance, like some unrolled algorithm, uh, then sort of like within this algorithm, there are the sampling patterns of like plays a role. And so we can, we can then treat the sampling pattern as, um, as, uh, as parameters to, uh, to tune. And so we can use basically like any off the shelf machine learning framework, TensorFlow, PyTorch, you name it, uh, to just like, like, like update these parameters. And so this is great because of like, you can sort of like fairly easily incorporate any kind of like, like realistic sampling into it. It's very easy to implement. It's also great in the sense it's like it's end to end as you optimize sampling pattern and uh, reconstruction method at, this, at the same time. But it's limited to having a neural network type of reconstruction, meaning like you have no mathematical guarantee, uh, guarantees of like what is happening when you actually run this method in practice. All right. So uh, as we said earlier, right? So like here, I mean, uh, we want to have a variational regulation approach for the reconstruction. And now we choose the following parameterization of the sampling pattern. So now our lower level problem uh, for each of the, of, the, of, the, of the data points is the following. So we, we fix the regularizer and then we want to choose or like learn a, a regularization parameter. And now sort of like for all the possible Fourier coefficients that, that we potentially could compute uh, using a certain, uh, certain uh, uh, discussion level, we then weight this Fourier coefficients with, uh, with, a, with a number sj or sj squared. And so if this number is zero, right, then this Fourier coefficient doesn't influence the reconstruction. If this number is one, then it does fully influence the reconstruction. Okay, so, um, and then we can, we can like write down the bi-level problem. So we want to learn the, the, uh, the regulation parameter, we want to learn these, uh, these vector S, which is, is like a it's like a binary vector uh, that tells us whether a full coefficient should have been sampled yes or no. But now this is not a continuous optimization problem, right? This is a discrete optimization problem since uh, the S takes discrete values. So therefore, also sorry, like there was a, I know like mixed up of thoughts. So 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 first of all, sort of like um, if we if we are in this in this discrete scenario still. 
then sort of like uh, there is a trivial solution when it comes to the sampling, right? So because the more samples we take, the better the reconstruction always will be, right? So uh, so this kind of like bilevel problem will always favor uh, that all the sample points should be chosen equal to one. And so therefore, like in addition, in our up-level problem, we need to have something that promotes sparsity because we're interested in uh, sampling as few sampling coefficients um, as possible. And so therefore, sort of like we, we add something to it that uh, based on this binary vector, you can think of it either as the L1 norm or the L0 norm. It's kind of like the same in, uh, in this scenario. Uh, but now uh, we also want to get rid of that we have a discrete optimization problem to solve and uh, sort of like replace the discrete vector S in 0, 1 by the continuous interval 0, 1 where again, zero indicates we don't sample, one indicates we do sample, but all the values in between, they don't really have a, have a proper meaning uh, in the application. And therefore uh, we also add another sort of like uh, regularizer on the sampling pattern where we encourage the sampling uh, to be binary, right? So like, uh, because since uh, the, the values SJ can be between zero and one, uh, this guy here is minimal, right? When either SJ is zero or when SJ is one, then the second factor is zero. All right. Okay. So like this is the model. And so how does it work in practice? Let's start with something super simple. Uh, let's start with, uh, with a piecewise constant uh, function, which is like this, uh, this rectangle. Um, and so it's only one training data point. So this is super simplistic, but just like see like, uh, just like how it works. The, uh, the Fourier data uh, looks like this. So we have two dominant directions which correspond to the, to the edges in this image. Uh, and so like this is now the logarithm of the modulus, right? Because the Fourier data is, is complex valued. And now if we add noise, then we can't see these dominant modes so much anymore. Uh, we can still see the center, but like the modes or like these dominant directions, they become a little bit like invisible. Um, and now uh, here at the bottom left, we have learned a sampling pattern, exactly with the approach that I just uh, discussed a second ago. And here on the right, we choose the largest Fourier coefficients, but now we cheated, right? So we took the largest Fourier coefficients of the clean data, right? So like if we knew basically that there are these dominant directions, right? Then we can choose these, uh, these larger Fourier coefficients. And now we do the reconstruction using total variation as a regularizer. And then the results look as uh, as follows: that sort of like the the, the learned uh, the learn pattern sort of like reconstructs the uh, the square almost perfectly, whereas you can you can clearly see that the large Fourier coefficient is not optimal, right? So like it, it is optimal if you don't choose a regularizer, but if you choose a regularizer, for instance TV, then it's better to choose a different pattern. And this is what we have learned here. All right. So here now, sort of like now some numerical examples on something that is uh, more relevant uh, in applications. And now like for simplicity, because we have these two upper level parameters, beta one and uh, beta two, we now for simplicity choose them uh, equal, which is like a fairly ad hoc choice. Uh, of course, you can choose this differently. Um, and so now as we increase this beta, right? So, um, and now we choose TV as a regularizer, we can see that uh, that the, the the learned sampling pattern becomes uh, more and more sparse. So, like for this beta, we get like a sparsity of eighty-two percent, and then forty percent to twenty-eight percent, and then the reconstruction quality does degrade a bit, but it doesn't fall very quickly. So, if like still with twenty-eight percent, we get a, a fairly reasonable reconstruction. And what's also interesting is that uh, the sampling also not only becomes sparser, but also becomes a bit more concentrated in the center. So here at the bottom, we kind of like did uh, uh, a Gaussian density estimate, uh, basically sort of like, like in some sense, you can, uh, you can think of it sort of like to like some estimation of um, sort of like of a probability density function. So if these were samples of, uh, of a random variable, what would the underlying probability density function look like? And so here, yeah, um, as you can see, so like in the beginning, it's fairly constant, and then it becomes more and more concentrated as we increase the parameter beta. Uh, in this example here, we compare different, uh, different regularizers. So now here in the, in the first column is TV regularization, second column, um, sparsity on wavelets, and the third one 
is H1 seminorm or squared H1 seminorm uh, regularization. And uh, so basically I mean the, the main message that we can see here is that the optimal pattern does depend on the regularizer, which also mean like intuitively makes sense. And now if we use these, uh, these probability density function estimates, and for instance, just compare wavelet to TV, and this is wavelet, I believe, on uh, sparsity on WG4 wavelet, uh, then we can also see that sort of like the tails of the estimated probability density function look quite different uh, when you compare wavelets and TV. So for wavelets, they seem to decay to something close to zero on the, uh, sort of like on the field of view. Whereas the TV seems to uh, seems to decay, but then seem but like the, the the decay either seems to level off or at least it to slow down a lot, such that like it's a little bit hard to say whether it would actually go to zero or whether it would stay constant. Um, so now here uh, for like Cartesian sampling, meaning sort of like now uh, not every point, uh, not every Fourier coefficient. So like it's associated with uh, with uh, with a parameter, but here we basically say uh, for like each of the of the lines in the in Fourier space, in discrete Fourier space, we, we want to decide: do we want to sample this line, yes or no? So therefore, the number of uh, parameters is much 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 smaller. So I believe here in this example, I think so the. Um, uh, the the number of pixels in these images I think are like of something around 200 squared. So here we have like something like around 200 parameters for the sampling pattern compared to like if you have the free sampling pattern, then we have like 200 squared parameters. And so because of uh, we, we learn this type of sampling, we can then compare to the uh, to the to the method proposed by the group of Volkan Cheva, uh, because their methods of like like doesn't scale to this other sampling pattern. And so what we can see is that sort of like their method, so here in the second column, uh, our method here in the first column, so it's maybe like slightly better than ours for this type of sampling pattern. So like we say like the, like the difference is very small. So like in SIM is really like uh, negligible, in PSNR it's like a little bit, um, and the sampling pattern looks a bit different. Uh, but sort of like the um, um, the uh, the quality sort of like is maybe a little bit better maybe like sort of like on uh, on their method but then for like our method kind of scales to sort of like much much larger problems where their method sort of like doesn't doesn't work anymore so here at the at the bottom left I have a comparison so for instance like for exactly like this uh, line sampling pattern that you can see here in the figure so like our method sort of like uh, needed four thousand lower level solves theirs needed twelve thousand so like I was like it's comparable I was a bit cheaper but maybe it's comparable. But then, so like for the free sampling pattern, so like ours only needs uh, something like seven thousand uh, um, evaluations, where the, whereas theirs needs something like in the order of uh, what is it, forty million evaluations. So it's totally infeasible to ever run this method in any reason reasonable time on a on a modern computer, even if you have like a very very powerful workstation or high performance computer. Good. Um, so, like, I have, uh, I think, two more results to share. So here um, is uh, on the on the x-axis, and here in the in the in the top graph is the fraction of k-space sampled, right? So, like, of, of Fourier coefficients sampled. So here on the right means that we sample all the Fourier coefficients. On the left, we we only sample twenty percent of the Fourier coefficients. And as we can see, the regularization parameter here in red. Um, sort of like um, like decreases as we uh, as we sample more points, which also potentially intuitively makes sense. So like as we sample more points, the importance of the regularizer becomes less important. So the regularization parameter can become smaller and smaller. And also we see uh, kind of like something that makes uh, makes sense of like as we sample fewer and fewer Fourier coefficients, then the image quality degrades. But also, like it seems to be fairly constant up to a certain point, let's say like up to maybe like 60, 70 percent of Fourier coefficients, and then it starts to degrade. Uh, something quite interesting is here at the bottom, where at the x-axis are the number of training examples used uh, in learning the sampling pattern, and on the y-axis is the image quality uh, measured in terms of structure similarity measure. And uh, so, as we if, if we only uh, only use one data point, one training image, 
then sort of like the accuracy on the on the test data set is quite poor. But then sort of like as we uh, uh, increase the training set to three to five and so on, it uh, gets better and better. But what is interesting is that the improvement, uh, if you compare 20 or 30 training uh, training samples, isn't big anymore. So like it, it seems to flatten quite quickly. So like in the in the beginning, there's a lot to be gained from using more examples, but then already something around 20 it seems to level off, which is perhaps a bit surprising, since of like in many other machine learning applications of like you gain a lot more from having more and more training data points. All right, the final example is uh, something quite high resolution. So these images are 1024 squared and we learn a free sampling pattern, meaning for each of the discrete Fourier coefficients, we learn one sampling pattern, meaning that we learn a million parameters, something totally infeasible, uh, sort of like with other, uh, with other approaches that are out there in the literature. And so here now we compare our approach compared to uh, what if we just sample the uh, the low frequency coefficients, uh, low frequency Fourier coefficients, and so sort of like as we can see, sort of like a, a learned pattern goes much more into higher frequencies than the low frequency pattern would do, and such that now for example, if you focus on a particular area in the in the phantom, uh, we can see that we can uh, we can resolve much much finer details. So if we go to higher frequencies, something that sort of like has been observed in literature before, but it's uh, kind of like very nice and encouraging that we see kind of like the same effect using our learned pattern. All right, with this I would like to conclude the talk. So um, I talked about bi-level learning, which is like a supervised learning framework that uses machine learning to learn parameters in a variation or regularization framework to solve inverse problems. Um, very important that optimization plays a key role in solving bi-level learning problems because these are sort of like bi-level optimization problems. And uh, we have seen that sort of having a dynamic accuracy, having some, some algorithm that, that basically makes use of this inexactness uh, sort of like uh, is, is good in terms of like it might increase your robustness and increase the efficiency of the algorithm. Um, but also then sort of like we were, uh, we were discussing sort of learning a sampling pattern, for instance, in MRI, uh, then this sort of like is in general better than a generic pattern, and it can be learned via bi-level learning. And so like the optimal uh, pattern depends on the regularizer, and perhaps a bit surprisingly, quite a few number of data points are needed in order to learn a good pattern. So the future work, the, the list is quite long, but like, so here are, are a list of a few topics that uh, part of them I'm currently working on, part of them I plan to look into it in the future. So first of all, uh, it's very natural to look at stochastic upper level problems, right? So like if we have like, uh, let's say like 20 or 30 uh, data points or, or, or even more, right? Then sort of like basically all algorithms that usually scale linearly with the number of data points. And so uh, you want to avoid this in order to be more efficient. Um, then uh, what if the lower level problem is non-smooth or non-convex? Can you then use any kind of like inexactness uh, in order to solve that? Um, what about uh, if we, so like in the, in the second part of the talk in the, for, the, for the MRI one, we actually there, we use this sort of like, uh, something called like stupid approach, we're kind of like ignoring all these errors that potentially could occur and just like blindly hit the problem with a quasi Newton method. And so like a very natural question is uh, sort of like uh, for those problems where you have like a, a large number of, uh, of, uh, of parameters, uh, can you sort of like maybe like extend the ideas of inexactness uh, from zero to free optimization to uh, first order optimization, which is kind of like more efficient in, uh, in higher dimensions. And uh, another problem that a PhD student of mine is working on is, uh, so what, uh, what about we uh, replace regularizer with a neural network? Uh, then, which again sort of has like a large number of parameters, can we kind of learn those parameters in a in a bi-level learning setting? Thank you very much for listening, and I'm very happy to answer any questions you may have.